Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's, tonight, this evening's, whatever, Hocus Focus. This is episode two of season two, and I'm Thomas Sheridan. And I'm Sarah Mondaini. And before we get to the night's program, we just want to thank you all for your fantastic feedback on the first episode of the new season, which is on Sarah's channel and broadcast last night, and how happy you were all to have us back and everything. It's really appreciated, and it's... Uh, it, it really was lovely to see so many positive comments and so much feedback that really, you know, really, really shows that you you love what we're into. And yet we are trying to capture some of that feeling of the past when TV was actually not a hostile or an intimidating place. Now, tonight, that's basically what the subject we're going to devote the whole show to tonight. And it's an unusual one. And it's not necessarily conspiratorial because it will also deal with many subjects surrounding psychology and even black magic. But tonight's topic will be the grimoire of the BBC for the whole show. Sarah and I have discussed this a lot off screen and it features quite heavily in our upcoming book. That we're both, I'm older than Sarah, but not not that much. Uh, and enough that when she was when I was a, in my late teens she was like in probably still in school we saw a lot of the same programs and I grew up on the east coast of Ireland so we were able to get the BBC and all the UK channels uh, from Wales beamed into the house and you know perfect quality so we were able to watch British television as well so I grew up on the same programs that many people in the UK grew up on watching them and look at this stage in both our lives we're looking back on them and we've realized that much of the broadcast that was done on the BBC from when we were growing up resulted in terrible psychological damage done to anyone who watched the programs and the societies exposed to them. Now, at first, that may seem preposterous to people, but when you hear us talk about the kind of programs that are presented, and how they were presented. If you look at a horror film, say one like Dracula, Dracula lives in a lavish, beautiful castle where everything seems perfect. He's all almost always handsome, debonair, courtly, and old world. He's this charming gentleman who resides in this place of opulence and charm. But it's all a trap. It's all a means of seduction. Well, the BBC is very much, nowadays it's much more sinister and overt on the surface. But the BBC in the past functioned the same way. Because it had an enormous budget and because it employed all the best directors, actors, writers, producers, the quality was often outstanding. They had TV plays and drama series and movies and documentary and news programs that had people on them who were the highest in the field of television anywhere. And it was this incredible professionalism and this standard of craft in front of the camera that seduced us all to the point where we forgot or didn't realize until much later on that were being damaged by many of the programs that we were watching on the BBC, that they had a cultural effect. And this effect was not accidental. Yes, we know about propaganda that's leaked into TV shows where someone might mention climate change or something else. We see, we've seen that in soap operas on TV shows all over the world. But it goes much deeper than that. There was tremendous gaslighting. And the Tavistock and Fabian Society have their fingers all over the programs. Now, those of you of a certain age will remember some of the programs that I'm talking about. Those of you who are younger, you have a chance to go back and look at these programs with the eyes that we didn't have when we watched them on the BBC when we were growing up. And it wasn't until later on we realized that it was a form of trauma-based mind control carry through the medium of very, very high quality entertainment. And so that's tonight's topic, the grimoire of the BBC. So, Sarah, tell us why you think this is an important topic to talk about. Because the BBC actually um, 
is such a big organization it's, it's bigger than the sum of its parts it's and it's difficult to pinpoint really who's in charge there and it's so big that it actually has the power and it does use the power to um portray how people see reality it doesn't um try to affect reality it actually tries to create its own reality for you to believe that, that this is how things are and um get your perception on what's going on and if you don't have the right bbc think then you are subjected to smear campaigns and ridicule and and the way they go about that is by um using the public to do their dirty work for them and you will be called um, a conspiracy theorist or you're spreading fake news or you're a danger to society or you're a granny killer or um, you're, you, there's something wrong with you. And it's all done from this seemingly what we thought was an innocent broadcaster that used to broadcast some on the surface really interesting uh, dramas and films but then when you get older and you look back and you see where we've come along the road you realize that actually just underneath the surface of what we thought were um, BBC plays and dramas and comedy and soap operas it's actually a social conditioning tool and um, it's it's if you're not open to that and you're not aware of it because they've got such clever um mind control tactics and black magic um principles then you're very likely to have spent most well myself included all of us have spent most of our lives being um tricked by it i would use the words bedazzled and glamoured in terms of the magical sense of it if you look at things even like the test card and the graphics they used they were often hypnotic they often some of them even the early test cards looked like sigils uh, you have the later one, the famous, I think it's test card F, is it? The one with the girl with the clown that we've often spoken about in our own programs here. And also the, the the first broadcast from the Alexandria Palace, the transmitter, there was something very gothic about it, but not in a cool kind of way, almost like in a Fritz Lang kind of way. You also had a situation where George Orwell worked in room 101 of the BBC and basically his whole knowledge of the propaganda and the dangers of the world to come were fermented in how he was how he was experiencing life within the BBC's actual propaganda division. Now, the first program I'd like to talk about, we will be talking about several programs and dramas tonight, but the one I would like to first talk about here tonight is one from the early 80s that I have a very strong memory of. I was still in high school when this came out. And the title of the program was called The Boys from the Black Stuff. The drama starred Julie Waters, who went on to become quite a famous star later on in movies like Educating Rita. And the film itself, is, or the TV show itself, was so well made and acted. It was The script was incredibly well written and the actors were top of the range at the time on this show. But the whole purpose of the show was a, an attack by the BBC metropolitan elite down in London upon the people in the city of Liverpool. They basically were decided that the city of Liverpool was to be a place of no hope. It was to be a place where hope went to die. Now, Liverpool was one of the biggest ports in the world. I think it was the biggest in the world at one time at the height of the British Empire. And the show on the surface spoke about how people had lost their livelihoods, had lost their jobs, had, and so on, and had lost the will to live. And it revolved around working class, former unemployed dockers trying to get their lives together in the wake of mass unemployment, while the old factories and the old warehouses and everything along the, the waterfront in Liverpool were being knocked down, which really did happen at that time. And the whole thing was incredibly dark and incredibly negative to give you a sense that there was no hope. Now, one of the central characters in it was an individual by the name of, his character name, Yozer Hughes. And Yozer Hughes' entire persona was a working class man who had never been unemployed in his life, suddenly found himself unemployed, and it put him into a state of mental illness, where he was going around saying, Gizjob, 
gives a job, gives a job. He couldn't say, and he, he had been rejected by so many places because there was no job, no jobs and mass unemployment in Liverpool that he basically, he would walk up to anyone on the street and go, gives a job, gives a job. Uh, because he'd been a man, the man had been broken. Now, the character of Yazer Hughes was at the time a very tragic character, uh, but it represented those very many dark things around it. It was actually played by the actor who played the King of Rohan in the Lord of the Rings movies, by the way. The character, yes, was a broken man. And on the surface, this whole thing of like, isn't he a tragic figure? But I can remember this growing up in Ireland during a time of high unemployment, is that rather than saying that your worth as a human being shouldn't be determined by a job, by an employment, by a career, and if you lose your job, your career and employment, you're still worth more than that. The show and the character of Riazzo used was to basically send the message out there that if you lost your job and if you became unemployed, you were a worthless human being because there was no alternative. Because every, And this was all the characters on the show, because every aspect and every dynamic of their personalities, their lives, their wants, their desires, their needs, their hopes were all based on having a job no matter what. It didn't matter if it was a crappy job just to have a job because a man wasn't a man unless he had a job. And this no, this notion that you were worthless and it was only madness, insanity and suicide left. And in fact, some of the characters in, the, in shows like this, we've seen it. Now, those of you who haven't seen the show, think of the movies by Ken Loach. Who Ken Loach actually began making TV dramas. And his films are all about how it's absolutely hopeless to be a working class person. And it's the same people writing these shows and producing them. The Oxbridge elites from the Oxford and Cambridge universities who basically treat working class people in an anthropological sense. Now, to compound this in a certain gaslighting humiliation ritual and that's what when you look back at the boys of the black stuff now it was a humiliation ritual of the people in Liverpool the character of Yazer Hughes someone put a song in the charts called Yazer Rap or something like that or Yazer Hughes Rap and they were taking the lines of his in the film and putting them in a TV show and putting them to a rap like here's a job I want a job Gives a job as stupid, absolutely moronic. But of course, it was played by BBC Radio One and entered the charts because it compounded the burlesquing of the people of Liverpool. Now, I can remember around the same time, Wham released their first single. I think it was Wham Rap, and or I think it was that. And it was all about Wham's first song was all about don't define yourself by being unemployed. Have a great time, enjoy your life, do what you have to do. And I can remember that Ram's first record by the British music press at the time of being trashed. Why? Because it gave working class people hope uh, by the same metropolitan elite who ran the BBC and were playing the Oz or Hughes rap. So the boys from the black stuff was the first one I remember that you would watch that show. And when you switched off, you'd want to slash your wrists because it was written, produced by the same Oxbridge, particularly Cambridge, university snobs and uh, metropolitan elites who again treated the working class as some kind of anthropological thing to study but also to to study in a in a pavlovian way to try and make them think of a way a certain way feel a certain way and generate a sense of home hopelessness it wasn't a surprise to me that the toxted riots which were riots that happened in liverpool at the same time and became some of the worst riots in the uk all happened around the same time. The collective focus of negative psychic energy was imposed on the people in the city of Liverpool. And this is what the BBC were central to it. The BBC were the mag magician who would make TV shows showing people in Liverpool as like washed up, useless working class people with no future. And then when they would, there was riots in the city, portrayed them as like drug addicts and so on and just useless people. At the, literally, the metropolitan elite had declared war in Liverpool. And a great testimony to people in Liverpool is that city has survived fine to this day. But that's what the BBC were like, a mind war against a particular city 
using a TV series, again, made to a very high standard of acting and writing called The Boys from the Black Stuff. Beyond the smokestacks and soot black industrial thrum of the North Midlands is a place built by digging. Clay, coal and iron off the broken sweating backs of flesh measured by the ton. Biddulph Grange is a place charged with a feeling somewhere between world and other worlds. During the 1920s it became a crippled society hospital and later orthopaedic and spinal wards and this is where I first encountered the place as a nine-year-old child. My brother and I would play in the grounds at visiting time in the half light of dusk, largely unaware that our mother was slowly ebbing away inside the building. At the time, the celebrated gardens were somewhat ramshackle and overgrown and filled both of us with delight and terror as we navigated its labyrinthine pathways and tunnels, encountering spectral children and awe-inducing gods of old. Son of a wealthy coal master and industrialist, Oxford-educated James Bateman inherited the Bateman fortune in the late 1850s. He put the fortune to work building and extending the former medieval farm into a sizeable mansion with a 15-acre garden, also a generous philanthropist, creating schools, housing and buildings for the betterment of the poor of the parish. These activities, along with his outwardly evangelical Christian zeal, was more than enough to get interests other than gardening and philanthropy past the cultural motion sensors of the time. The high Victorian era loved nothing more than a facade, and behind the facade at Bedolf Grange grew and blossomed not only roses, but the burgeoning tendrils of an occult society, the roots of which may go down through the fertile soil of history back to the incalculable genius of Dr. John Dee, and perhaps even further to the Templars. 1572, John Dee, along with other notables of the time, witnessed a new star emerge in the heavens, now referred to as the Tycho Supernova, or SN1572. D and others saw this as the dawn of a new era of enlightenment and formed a new magical order of engaged hermetic thinkers of the time, supposedly calling it the Order of Me and I, an anagram of I am one. It was short-lived and came to little, but the name of the order and intent is speculated to have been revived some 300 years later at Biddulph Grange. The Batemans played host to many in high society, especially those with esoteric leanings, rubbing shoulders and entertaining the likes of Arthur Waite, actress Florence Farr, W.B. Yeats and a host of pre-Raphaelites including Edward Byrne Jones, William Morris and his wife Jane. Bateman, along with his wife Maria and artist Edward Cook, busied themselves with not only horticulture but the design and construction of a series of temples throughout the garden interconnected by walkways and tunnels. Walking around the garden, now run by the National Trust, it is evident that the surreal design was intended to induce an altered state of consciousness, to destabilize reality, almost like a magical ritual. Moving through a Celtic glen, complete with original menhirs and sacred spring, swallowed by the darkness of subterranean tunnels and spat out into Chinese temples, boasting golden pagan idols. Dank Egyptian tombs with flesh-coloured walls. The inner sanctum terminated with a menacing statue, the ape of Thoth. All these incongruencies shifting the tilt of the psyche, making it feel like a mystical experience. And all this a theatrical backdrop to robed rites, rituals and seances of the Victorian occult revival.
The Grange, described by lay hunters as a nodal point on the backbone of Albion, the Bolinus Line, intersecting this line is the largest feature at the Grange, the Wellingtonia Avenue. A mile long, it is aligned with the Midsummer Sunrise, which in days past illuminated the interior of a cave chapel in which were found the graves of Templar Knights. Little remains of the chapel today, but the grave covers now curiously form seating outside St. Lawrence's Church, a half a mile away. Some of the esoteric luminaries that regularly attended the gatherings in the 1860s and 70s went on to become synonymous with magical orders such as the Golden Dawn and the Sphere Group. But for the Batemans, the good times came to an end. Inheritance spent and a severe fire in 1896, apparently started during a seance, gutted many rooms and apartments, forcing the Batemans to sell. Biddulph Grange endured the next century largely by luck due to its use as an infirmary of one type or another. The gardens were used to give the sick access to fresh air and bucolic scenery. I see the place as a personal initiation point. My brother and I experienced what we now think of as exposure to something beyond. One evening, we came upon two other children, a girl and a boy, wearing what we thought of as old fashioned school clothes, short trousers and a pinafore dress. At the time, thinking that they were just from a posh school, but there for the same reason as us, visiting time, trying to engage with them they just chuckled and the girl said, you do know the world is going to end. Then they walked away. On regular visits, we never saw them again. As a nine-year-old, you just shrug and get on with things, thinking them a bit strange. Not too long after this encounter, our mother died. Was this the meaning of the girl's statement? It certainly felt that way at the time, but that magical time in that magical place, I feel, we feel, we were given a gift. The sense that consensus reality is just the surface of things. The elites at the BBC like to psychologically attack the working class and it was always the northern working class through the plays and the kitchen sink dramas and it was done so either you know you don't forget your place and Ken Loach I think got off on making films that portray life in working class towns and communities as being really grim and miserable um, and on the edge of poverty all the time and I think it was to therefore like further push his socialist views and ideologies upon his audience, as well as the approved ideologies of the BBC. And he always portrayed life in the North as though the only form of escape was through finding some solidarity in a political party and living your life with a socialist mindset as opposed to having a mindset of your own. Exactly. He even made a film about Ireland called The Wind That Shakes the Barley, and he said, yeah, Ireland, you know, the Irish Revolution happened, but it didn't ex achieve what it should have achieved because they didn't listen to the socialists and the Marxists, which is a complete fake uh, story of Irish history. But he had to interject that into that film. Always this elite socialist Marxist Cambridge mentality. Yeah, agreed. And um, a lot of the play for today is the BBC play for today. Um, kind of had some political agenda weaved into there. Usually a, a Marxist or um, revisionalist, is that the word I'm looking for? Revisionalist, yeah. Yeah, um, like Marxist revisionalism where they want to um, plant the seeds in your mind and they want to change things, they want to get rid of something to bring something else in. Yes, very much so. For the Guardian readers to read and look at, and talk about tut, 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 these working class people, let's help them. Uh, aren't we so lucky we're not like them? Ken Loach's, I think, most recent film was a film called I, Daniel Blake. I haven't seen it, but friends of mine seen it and said, you'd literally want to slash your wrist at the end of it. And it just shows that being working class is there isn't a hope in hell. 
what you say about the attack on the northern thing, that, even in Ireland, I didn't really understand England that well. Like to me, it was all England. I didn't really understand the regional differences, but I could always tell that the there was a certain aspect of it never happened in London. It happened in Newcastle and Manchester and Liverpool and Sheffield and Blackburn, Burnley, all these kinds of places. And one, one, one I remember, there was a series on the BBC called Second City something, Second City, Second City Coming or something like that. It was like play for the day. And one of them was about a guy who lived in Newcastle who was who wanted to be a country squire so badly, but he was a poor guy living in it. And it was it was mocking. He wanted to, he wanted to his escapism was to go into the countryside wearing a kind of a you know a, a deer stalker's cap by like Sherlock Holmes type and have a walking cane. And he wanted to believe he was a squire just to escape his terrible working class life in, in Newcastle. And that was a burlesquing. That was a mockery. It was like, you'll never be one of us, you know? And in the end, he kills himself, I think, by throwing himself off the, the, the Tyne Bridge into the River Tyne and, and, and this kind of thing. And you and I, speaking of play for the day and these kitchen sink dramas, again, very, very well made, very high level of acting and, and, and scripting, but all done with an agenda. And we, you and I watched one recently just for this show as a good example. It's also available on YouTube under a different name, so it's not taken down. But an, an actual rec a watcher of the show recommended this to me, so I want to thank them. And it was a play for the day show called Housewife's Choice. Now, what did you think of that, Sarah? Well, on the surface, when it first, and I mean, I knew there was some, going to be something behind it, but when you first start to watch it, you just think it's a gentle play and it's going to be about bored housewives, maybe. And then you realise, actually, it was programming women to think that looking after the home wasn't good enough and that the family unit should be broken down. And I think that time might have been the beginning of um, the feminist lies that were pushed through the TV which has led many women to kind of mental illness and a lifetime of suffering. And it was programming women to think, um, well, women were claiming to be slaves to the children and the husbands, only then to find themselves being slaves to the boss and having the kids raised by strangers. And apparently that was okay. That kind of slavery was okay for these women. But if you were submissive to your husband and your family, then... Um, it, you were being suppressed by the man. And that's what I got from, from that show. Um, and at the very end of, of, of the, the play, well, again, you had this juxtaposition of the lady played by Francis Delator, who I think is a socialist anyway in real life. Um, she was the rich middle-class hoity-toity woman who'd been um, scorned by her husband and then you had the um, the other family, which the couple, which again was the same guy who played the Ozzy Hughes, wasn't it? Bernard, um, I forget his surname, Bernard something. And um, Sharon Juice was the was the woman, and they were um, they were down on the uppers and found themselves homeless. So they were the, at the complete other end of the scale. And then you had this middle class suburban housewife trying to brainwash this woman into um seeing that the family the family isn't everything and and being submissive to your husband isn't everything did you know she that, says, oh, sorry the the, the 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 working class woman, woman was a pretty blonde and yes. Tour was a plain almost like these woke Cenobites you see today in the 1970s style yes which which it reminds me at the very end of the play, she says something at the end in this horrible um, brainwashed sort of AI kind of voice where she says that um, art and technology will be merged and will create an androgynous society. And I knew then, I knew, I thought, oh, my God, that's just going to this um agenda that we've got today where they want to reassemble society and um, they want to do this slow process of um 
destroying all the traditions and the individuality and the family in order to kind of reassemble it back together as a communist utopia with no notion of gender or traditions and morals, no God or family and everything dependent on the state and the state owning everything, including your kids. And this uh, middle-class housewife played by Del uh, Francis Della Tour, she was all up for that. She said that her child, her baby, shouldn't really belong to anybody. It should be. It should belong to everybody, she said. Which is, I know, should be bare to uh, bare to without mothers or something like that. She also says, or without pain. And yes. The, the, that was the that's the Fabian Society that was actually central to their documents in the nineteen twenties and thirties. And a lot of the writers in the BBC would have attended places like the London School of Economics, and would have been subject to these Fabian doctrines that were written by people like uh, H.G. Wells, the science fiction writer, and also George Bernard Shaw, the Irish, famous Irish playwright. Now, these people were fraternizing with the uh, the royal families and then deciding that people that don't, aren't worth saving shouldn't be saved because they're not contributing to society, like as if the royals are. But what I found interesting about that was was the use of camera work. You see, this, this is kind of magic is like this kind of use of magic. Uh, it starts off innocuous enough when she starts propagandizing in you know propagandizing in the actual TV show Francis de la Tour. She talks a little bit about like I had everything, but I wasn't going to be content being a woman living in New York with my rich husband. Blah blah blah. You notice that the camera zooms in at that point. This is to draw the viewer. This is hypnosis now to draw the viewer in. But that monotonal, scary speech where she's in almost trance where she talks about we will have an androgynous future, there'll be no this. That was pure Fabian Fabian society, London School of Economics, PAP. And that was put in there for the purpose of engineering socially in, in exactly the same way as in 2013, I think it was, when Russell Brand, Brand was put on... Russell Brand, yeah. Russell Brand was put on Newsnight when Jeremy Clarkson, why you have this washed up this of this unfunny comedian being brought in to talk about the banking bailouts? And he goes, We need a, a massive distribution of wealth through international socialism, this kind of thing. That was pure stage Fabian society. He was put in there as a plant, which he remains to this day. That's why he was immediately on the cover of the New Statesman magazine, produced by of the uh, the Fabian Society. And also remember, the Fabian Society also created the British Labour Party. Now, the British Labour Party had huge power within the BBC. They would they would be the ones to make sure that certain that working class people were given jobs in the BBC. But who would they pick? Jimmy Savile, these types. These types would be given jobs. And we all know that we'll talk about this later when we talk about come to the, the Savileites and all that kind of thing. But the I think the, the viewer now is starting. You're probably saying I'm watching Focus Focus to hear about something else. No, we will deal with some of this stuff. But you, you, what you're hearing is you you live in a you're saturated and you live in a sea of sorcery. You don't know it, but it's marketing, advertising, political doctrine, television, mass media. It's nonstop. It's just not called sorcery, but that's what it is. And it's to alter your mind. And the you know what is the definition of black magic? to try and alter the will of another person w without them knowing. So someone sits down to watch a TV play, a science fiction show, anything, and what do they get? Which reminds me, do you remember the premise, the initial premise behind Blake 7, the science fiction show, which is actually one of my favorite shows from, from that era? The premise was that Blake had been falsely accused of child molestation. And that was yeah. happening, and, and and that's why he went against the Federation, who were like a one world government led by a and a semi androgynous female called Servalin, who was this like kind of like dominatrix with bitch queen, which kind of thing. So you were seeing all the fantasies of the the writers being played out there, uh, and, and and so many things. It, it's it's strange because a lot of the younger people today think that these agendas that are coming out now, they just suddenly appeared in 2020 and they didn't. They've been um, being peddled on the TV since at least that I can think of the 70s. And that play for today, that housewife, cho housewife's choice is uh, 
it's just the proof is in the pudding if you go and watch that. 1974. Um, 1974, was it? Yeah. And so all these agendas that they've been pushing, it's nothing new. Uh, it's been there, I think it's probably been there since the TV was switched on, since, since the transmissions were switched on. And when we say, um, when you say a sea of black magic, it's not that we're referring to robes and rituals that you might think. We're not saying that that doesn't go on within the lodges, but in the context of using black magic here on the public, it's talking about manipulation and psychological terror and propaganda and um, distortion of facts and smear campaigns to get the public to think and act as the elites desire. And they've cast a spell over the masses by bombarding them with distorted information through the television. It's always through the television in the effort to control your thoughts and actions. And people say, oh, no, I can watch the TV and I've got um, I've got an eye for this stuff and they're not going to get through to me. But they use, they've got so many tactics. They use comedy, they use fear, they use soap operas, drama, things that will pull you in and it's not actually on the surface of of what you're watching it's just below it and if you're not i think it, um what was the propaganda master called goebbels yeah joseph he, he goebbels. said joseph goebbels in order for propaganda to work then the people that you're giving it to as soon as they realize that it's there it doesn't work anymore so it's never well, it's getting more in your face now, but it, it's it's never really in your face unless you're awake to it, unless you're unless you know what's going on. Um, and let's not let's not you know forget the fact that these hoity-toity, well-off types behind the BBC, they do go to these masses, these black rituals, these events. We we know for I know for a fact that the the Dennis Wheatley's novels of the stately home rituals things that have been portrayed in movies like eyes wide shut uh, the ninth gate the films like uh, the the satanic rites of dracula and so on that you have all the high polyer involved they know about this stuff in fact the concept of a, a smear campaign was invented within the masonic lodges during their grand banquets they would decide who to destroy somebody and they would create a, a all agree that this guy, even if he didn't do it, had did it, and they would spread this all around and destroy him through, through this Masonic grand, through these Masonic grand banquets, and it was considered an act of war. This is why they called the implements in front of them like the the glasses were called cannons, the knives were weapons, swords, you know, and they used gunpowder was wine, sparkling gunpowder was champagne. And brandy was fiery gunpowder. I mean, they, these, this was an act of war. And then they would seek to destroy someone in the town. And so a lot of these BBC types would have been heavily involved around the corner. Well, down from Shepherd's Bush in the Grand Lodge of London, down in the city of London. So let's not forget that they're in that stuff too. They do have a background in it. That Dennis Wheatley stuff and the London Operations Group, that didn't come out of nowhere. They actually were experimenting. They 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 learned that and brought it into the into the into the society. So maybe it's not directly spells magic and hexes, but it's the same thing. The the BBC use the programming to manipulate people's minds and behaviour, and they give you the illusion of choice. You know, I can turn over, I can put something else on. Is BBC two, BBC three, but in reality, they're still steering the na the narrative in their favour. And they're making people unknowingly act against their own interests for the benefit of, of those that are in control. And that form of manipulation is actually controlling somebody's will and bending it to their own desires. And therefore, it is black magic. And it's all hiding behind this facade of legitimacy and authority. And it's a psychological game. And then society's left to deal with the consequences of their manipulate their manipulated decisions, and they use um, psychological terror, like we've said, and smear campaigns to keep people in line. And then all the while they step back, and then they present themselves as the gatekeepers of truth and information. And 
the control that they've got over people goes beyond just mere entertainment or information um, dissemination. It's about shaping society by shaping everybody's beliefs into their own image. And they've created their own spell and the public is unknowingly caught up in its enchantments. And one of the things that I found interesting was the nickname that it had been given, which was Auntie. It was Auntie Beeb. So it was this sweet little old lady, you know, that was um, kind and um, cared about you. And it had people treating it like it was a family member or a friend and starting to view it as familiar company and reassurance. So, you know, you've had a bad day at work. Never mind, EastEnders is on. That'll take your mind off things. You feel like something isn't right or you're having a moment where you're seeing through the illusion. That's okay. Great British Bake Off's on later. And you'll have to watch it or you'll look like a social leper at work tomorrow. Yes, uh, from casting a spell to broadcasting a spell. I always remember like the humiliation kind of stuff on the game shows. There was a show back in the day called The Generation Game, hosted by Bruce Forsyth. And if you look at it, he used to like basically just humiliate the contestants. And at the end of it, the prizes were crap. They were absolutely rubbish. And you had to remember them. Like they were, And this is a, an organization that was taking in enormous amounts of money and yet they would give people like a, a toothbrush as, 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 a, as a prize for winning the show. And it was pure humiliation, totally and completely. And the, the, you could always sense that they had a contempt for the people behind the, behind the presentation. I always felt that, that elitism never, ever went away. A good example of that would be Monty Python's Flying Circus. In recent times, you've had John Cleese railing against political correctness and wokeness, but they invented it. They invented it in that show. And yeah, and there's a lot of that show was very, very funny. But again, they were all like from like the Cambridge Footlights crowd. They were all like from the, the posh universities and the, this kind of thing. And that's the only reason they got on TV. No other reason. And they because they were in the right, they came from the right pedigree and if you look at a lot of those things that they got away with back then you know how come i mean if some of it is as offensive as bernard manning who was a working class comedian and yet they've been totally let off the hook about it they've totally been let off the hook in fact it's the only i don't i've never heard bernard manning use the n-word but monty python did in a, in, a, in a deliberate joke uh, and they've never been held accountable for that why? Because they they come from the right class. They come from the right, they're the same kind of people who are in the Fabian society and the same kind of people who go to the right schools and so on. And that's what I always find very, very sinister. Yeah. Um, they use things like satire to as a clever tool to, to manipulate people. And they might package it as harmless entertainment, but there's more to the comedy the BBC then meets the eye and they take individuals like say um, just off the top of my head uh, Nigel Farage for in for instance and they take these individuals who challenge the BBC group think and ideas and beliefs and they put them on they put their subjects on shows like Mot the Week to ridicule them through satire and canned laughter and carefully selected audiences and it's all part of the conditioning and the, for the viewers and shaping the thoughts and opinions under this disguise of humour. And they want you to think a certain way. And um, if we don't laugh along with the audience, they make us feel like we're not cool or there's something wrong with us. Or, or it's like they use peer pressure to control how we react and think. And it's really sly and they make it seem like it's all in good fun. And in reality, they're just indoctrinating you with their ideas and that like we've said before the worst part is people don't even realize it's happening and then we're given this really carefully um curated version of reality that they want us to accept without question yep i often found things like mock the week and especially have i got news to you we seem something very masonic about them the way you have the grand master in the middle who awards points for the ones who humiliates the correct target. 
you know, as you said, it might be Nigel Farage one week, it might be Donald Trump the next. That of all that that is clearly obvious, but also in terms of obviousness, it's a lot more th- their propaganda is a lot more overt today. And I think the reason why is people have been dumbed down a lot since the 70s. In the 70s, they couldn't have gotten away with, or in the early 80s, what they're getting away with now. Because even like working class people were far more sophisticated and they were aware of things. So they had to subtly put it into dramas, put it into TV shows, uh, sneak it in, in allegory, sneak it in as like subliminals within the sketch, within the script were in the dialogue they were much more and and that you know and you see like that housewife's choice was a fabulous example of that you know i i was watching that when she went on that like speech part i my jaw nearly hit the floor it was literally a fabian society it, it was like she was reading a script a script that hg wells or george bernard Shaw had handed to her it was so out there but at the time people would have thought Oh, what is this is kind of interesting. What what's this? What does that mean? What does what does this mean? You know, you know, wouldn't really think about it. Uh, she was she was an incre- incredibly privileged position in British society. The character played by Frances de la Tour, and yet she thought she was oppressed. And that's the woke today, isn't it? That's the that's the you know the the, the soy boys. That's the you know the, the 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 big babies we have in society today. The privileged. They have everything that they they lack nothing, but they, because they're bored or dead inside, because there's no spiritual identity inside them, um, they 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 think they're oppressed. Her husband left her though in that show, didn't he? He knew. He knew, and also she was jealous of the the relationship between. Even though her husband, the, the blonde girl's husband, was unemployed, they were still in love. And making a baby, and you could see that she was furious about that because they 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 were together. They stuck together, even though how poor they were, and they hid their poverty very well, the best they could. They weren't like destitute or anything. They were living in a car, but I found that very. And she resented their love, their their love through hardship, and that, and but not in a way that you you watch the show and go, what an old bitch. It was more in a way like, oh well, she's kind of right. There was another TV show, it was another BBC sitcom called Butterflies that had Wendy Craig in it and Jeffrey Palmer, who I think died recently. Again, very some very funny scenes and some tremendous acting. Nicholas Lindhorst, who you've mentioned on this show from Good Night Darling and uh, Only Fields and Horses, but that was his first acting job, I think, as the young one of the young two sons. But the whole purpose of that show is that a woman could never be happy being a mother and a housewife. That was the whole trajectory of the show. It, it represented nothing else. And her husband uh, loved her, idealized her, worked very hard for her, wanted to give her and her kids the best life they could. And he had a better relationship with the sons because at least there was an, an intergenerational thing there. But she was completely, he was almost declared as the enemy just for existing. You know, just for existing, he was almost declared the enemy. And that was, again, had life is like a butterfly. It's this lovely little intro, like Auntie Beeb. It's soft and gentle as you try. And then you have this hardcore feminism, extreme feminism, delivered through the concept of a sitcom. Yeah, and that it's okay if you're bored at home with your husband, it's okay to go and bugger off to the park every lunchtime having an affair with that man because he was a man, wasn't he, that she was seeing but he was a mess and he was actually a nice guy too. So she was manipulating a nice guy who was lonely. So she was actually kind of a devious character in a way because, uh, you know, yeah, okay, the marriages break down all the time, things happen. But she was portrayed as a victim when she was a willing party and everything that was going along. If anything, you know, she, she was the, the will. And there was even one scene where she starts smoking the son's weed uh, you know, and it was like supposed to be so funny and everything like that. Uh, but it was all done because, like, you know, she's going, she's going insane because she has a, a man who loves her and, and 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 worships her. Yeah, and the the husband had no idea there was anything wrong. Really, she well, never like, spoke to him all through the series. She never said, "I'm I'm bored." No, and 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 the and the allegory was that he was a butterfly collector. He was interested in butterflies. And she was just one of his collection. But he didn't see her that way at all. You know, that's just how the, the, you're made to think. 
just you know when you see the blatant propaganda of that now the little happy's team tune and everything and then you know like i said that that's everything literally non-stop like a classic one of recent non-stop social engineering is philip schofield now skill of philip schofield turns out he's having an a homosexual affair with an intern at the same time his whole public image is of a family man and um, you know uh, he's always talking my wife and kids we did this my wife and kids we did this and he's having a, a homosexual relationship with a, a young intern now when that all came out not once did he have to stand in front of the camera saying, I apologize to my family. No, he celebrated as a hero for being a living, being, being gay. And the wife and the kids are completely discarded. And he sits there. I saw a show where he, he sat there and BBC presenters were lining up to say, you are the most amazing man in the history of the world. Like, worship him like a god. It was the most sickening things you've ever seen. Rather than one, anyone, someone saying, you know, why were you playing husband of the year? Yeah, we know marriages fall apart. We know things happen. But why were you playing husband of the year of the century, professional house husband, professional husband and father when you were you were buggering interns, male interns? That's why I had no sympathy for him or interest when it all all came to light. You know, the second time round, a couple of years later, it came round. And now it's where it is now. And yeah, he's lost his job. Yeah, but there's um, still people defending him and calling it homophobe, what's happened to him. You know, it's it's, it's quite remarkable. It really is incredible. We don't, like I'm hocus focus here, we're, we're, we're not about getting involved in people's personal lives or judging people that way. We're human beings. But it's when a certain image is presented and... It's not like that. That's what I think bothers people like us the most. And the, we reached that an almost tragic comedy case at the BBC Newsman. And, you know, I'll let you, you Edwards, I'll let you go run with that one, Sarah. Yeah, Hugh Edwards, when he's um, he was do, uh, texting or in, sending messages to, they say teenagers, but I think they were late teens. When, but they, they portrayed it as though it could have been a child, but I think they were... 17 or 18 and um I remember I don't watch I don't have a tv license and I don't watch the tv but when it was all going off I was at a friend's house and I said it'd be just and we didn't know who it was and I said it'd just be interesting put news at 10 on and let's have a look who's um who's introducing it tonight and there was a woman introducing it and obviously the big story was this Hugh Ed. Uh, this BBC star that had been sending thirty five thousand pound over the years to these this teenager for pornographic pictures, and the woman was sat in huge chair, deadpan about how bad it is and how this disgraced star not only paid thirty five thousand pounds to um, a teenager, but he also broke the lockdown rules and got in his car during the middle of lockdown to go to this teenager's flat. So this teenager, you know, he's obviously old enough. One of the teenagers was old enough to have his own flat. And uh, he but he broke the lockdown and then all that was brought. And then all the COVID, uh, all the, um, uh, what can we, all the Rona, all the Rona stuff was brought into the um news article and it went right away from this BBC star that had sent money to a teenager for pictures and we ended up having to listen to the COVID lockdown, uh, the, the Rona lockdowns. Shifting the narrative, they're, they're geniuses at that. Uh, the, uh, and the average person watching it will just go along with it. Their their minds have been entertained and enter entrained and they're just brought in with the gaslighting to the next thing. It's really incredible stuff, really, when you think about it. But the, the biggest gaslight was she was sat in his chair. We didn't know who it was. It was the night before it, it came out. She sat in his chair, go, you know, go, doing the report. And the day after, you think, you were sat in his bloody chair, and you knew very well who it was. It was your predecessor, or it was your um, it was your anchor man. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I, yeah. The farcical dishonesty. And 
now for tonight, Hocus Focus Folk Horror Cinema. Yes, we're sticking with the BBC, but we're going back into our usual 40th thing. And as I as we were saying at the beginning, the BBC makes very good stuff too. In, as long as you keep the they keep the propaganda out of it. And tonight, the Folk Horror Cinema is the 1972 BBC Christmas television special, The Stone Tape. In 1972, BBC Two Television presented on Christmas Day, as they did every single year, usually very good ghost stories to actually scare the bisto out of you and the kids after your Christmas dinner. And in that particular year, they featured a special sci-fi horror film called The Stone Tape, a movie surrounding something we love on Hocus Focus, residual hauntings, psychometry, and psychic imprints of past lives and experiences within an old building. The show, The Stone Tape, was broadcast in the evening and attracted an audience of almost 3 million viewers. It was described as one of the best TV broadcasts in the genre ever and was to this day is considered one of the best things the BBC ever made. And the reason is obvious, the writing. It was written by the Manx playwright and again, another favourite of Hocus Focus, Nigel Neal, who you best know for the Quatermass TV and cinema movies and also Halloween, Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, which he disowned. We'll review that at some point in the future. It was directed by Peter Sasti, who also directed many top horror hammer films, including Taste the Blood of Dracula and Countess Dracula. So the pedigree for the show, for the film, The Stone Tape, was extremely high. We had Nigel Neal writing it, the best dystopian sci-fi horror writer of a generation in, in England, the UK, although he was Manx, and a former Hammer director. Now, the film starred a Michael Bar Bryant as Peter, who is the overly intense head of a research team for an electronics company who move into an old Victorian mansion in order to use the different rooms for audio tests. Now, the initial premise behind this is they're a British high-tech electronics company, and they're amazed and upset by how good the Japanese electronics is or back in 1972 by the way so there's some really nice reel to reels and stuff on display in the show if you like that kind of thing so this was the reason for the room was to detect, test all the different frequencies and so on in order to prove that their british electronic were tape recorders were better than the, the fancy Japanese ones that were flooding the market. Along with the team and as a group of them included also a computer programmer called Jill, who was played by Jane Asher. And she begins hearing coming from a particular room, strange noises and also sees the specter of a Victorian woman. Now at the top, at the top of a narrow set of stairs, None of the high-tech recording equipment, audio equipment, picks up the sound of the women, even though the researchers and the technicians hear it with their own ears and it comes through on the headphones of the the reel to reel. It does not work on it does not actually end up on the magnetic tape. They also have uh, ultraviolet and infrared cameras on it that can that can see the ghost, but they don't see it. It doesn't it doesn't show up and that even these are these are technical engineering people who trust the scientific trust the electronics are very proud of the machines they're making and are being kind of tormented by the fact that the machines can't pick up the ghosts any more than you know they're actually seeing ghosts it just makes it so interesting now at this point, the stone tape theory comes in and actually became in real life following this a, a real Fortean subject. And actually people will talk about the term stone tape today. Now, the, the show looks pretty great for its time. The film looks pretty great for its time. I have to say, it it's typical of a lot of that type of broadcast on the British, on the BBC back then, and that looks almost a lot like a stage play. 
In fact, it could have it, it could be a stage play in how it's actually set up. And a, a lot of the af- acting is that method acting, that kind of like, you know, situational uh, enunciation and diction that you get in stage acting. So that actually, but it actually somehow kind of adds to it. You know, it adds to the actual effect. So they, they have this frustration and this thing going on with the, the ghost and the noises and the electronics. And when Jill returns to the room for one last time, a powerful, malevolent presence from a much older recording besieges her, sen- her senses and takes her over. And she dies while frantically trying to escape this malevolent force. Later on, we show an inquest where Peter tries to denounce Jill as being mentally unstable. But then after that, he asks all of Jill's research to be brought forward for historical, for, for, you know, for historical uh, archiving without destroying it. And he makes the final visit to the room and discovers to his horror that the stone tape has made a new crystal clear recording of its now Jill being the ghost trapped within the residual haunted psychometric stone of the, the of the of the old Victorian mansion. Yes, it has it can be over OTT at times. Jane Asher's acting is not always the best. But having said that, it's it really is fantastic. And it's also an interesting thing in that it's a TV show that's spawned a real element of real 40 and research and investigation and that's the stone tape what did you think of the stone tape sarah i thought it was seriously creepy um perhaps a bit outdated but then that actually adds to its eeriness and it's like a mix of horror and sci-fi and those old school massive computers and scientists in the white coats from the 70s just gave it another level as well and it reminded me of the shows like sapphire and steel which used to scare me as a kid as well. And at first, it seems like a classic haunted house story where the scientists want to use the computer tech to study this ghostly phenomenon that they've they've discovered. But one of the scientists, Jill, who's a medium, senses something bad about the place right from the start. And she had a foreboding about being there to stay away when she first parked up in the opening scene. And she thought she was going to be crushed between two vans. And she wasn't, but that's how it seemed with her nervous system telling her just to get the hell away. And like Thomas says, as they investigate, they realise it's not a ghost haunting the place, but it's um, the stone in the room is psychometrically recording Sorry, he's psychometrically recording past events and playing them back. And for some reason, the devices can't capture what they're experiencing. And each person in the team seems to perceive a different um, phenomena. Some of them can hear sounds and Jill can see actually see the image. Um, another team member can't see anything or feel anything. And then they conclude that the Stones tape doesn't actually produce sound or light when it's playing back but it interacts with the human nervous system which gives the illusion of hearing sound and vision and that's why some are more sensitive to it because it's more like telepathic communication from the stone and Jill being a medium she reacts dramatically when she sees the ghost image and throws herself on the floor and even the so-called rational skeptics of the team have similar reactions when they encounter this phenomena. And there's a lot of throwing themselves on the floor, which I thought made it feel a bit overdone. But overall, the, the creepiness was still there. And the head scientist, Peter Brock, he gets all excited um, about the potential of this new discovery, this stone theory. And he imagines this futuristic way of recording and playing back experiences through a person's senses. And he's having a laugh saying, oh, BBC Two, and no, oh, let's uh, yeah. press record and let's stop recording. Um, and as the story goes on, they realise the stone's recordings are actually getting erased and overwritten. Um, and then something malevolent in the room takes Jill, one of the team members, and then we can hear her death recording playing repeatedly as the film ends. And I think another thing that adds to the spookiness is that, well, I never understood or we didn't get to know what that entity in the room actually is, 
or why the wall is telepathically broadcasting the deaths that this thing, this entity may have caused. And I like to think it was because the house was trying to warn people to stay away from whatever dangerous entity was present. And the opening scene with Jill having that panic attack in a parked car could have been the Stones' attempt to warn her to go away because it wasn't going to end well for her. And then the film reminded me of other classics like Poltergeist um, and even John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. And when I looked it up, the film, um, I did it, it. That's what that film was based on, Prince of Darkness. And it's interesting that John Carpenter even paid homage in that film to Nigel Neal by naming the university or the institute in that movie after him. Yeah. Um, it's and it's a it's a dated film, and the aesthetics are the very beige, and everybody seems to be wearing beige trousers, and even the stone wall was beige, and all the characters except Jill, I found them to be they were very loud and boisterous and talking yes. over each other, and I think it was to try and create a sense of a real workplace, even though they were in this Victorian house, but I did find that. Um, talking over each other was a bit overwhelming at times. Um, and the film's dated props, although they weren't dated at the time, things like the massive computers and the scientists in the classic white coat just brought about some nostalgia from the days when I was first caught up in the world of Supernatural and watching things like that on TV. And it's strange how something as simple as the beige aesthetics and the way the characters looked can take you back to that time when you're both scared and intrigued by the unknown. Um, and it's interesting to note here uh, in light of tonight's BBC grimoires um, that Nigel Neal actually was another person who became very disenchanted with the BBC, mainly because of result, as a result of the rejection of several of his scripts that he'd written, actually for the BBC series play for today, and his scripts for a fourth um, Quatermass series were also rejected, so he moved over to ITV. Yeah. But I, overall... Another sorry. one it reminded me of was The Legend of Hell House, where the scientists selling the equipment up in the middle of the room to capture the ghost or clear the ghost. It was different premise, but it was a similar kind of approach. Yes, yeah, yeah, because I thought at first you think, is it a haunted house film? And it's not, it's not really. But yeah. Overall, I liked it overall. It left me with the same unsettling feeling that those 1970s horror and sci-fi genres created in me as a kid. And um, it kind of rekindled the same feelings and sensations I had when I used to watch them back then. And it was almost like watching it now was like watching it with my past self, where it was me, the adult, and me, the child, were both kind of experiencing those creepy moments again. So it was good, yeah. I I didn't know about it until a few years ago, until I didn't even know it existed, until our friend uh, Greg Moffat at Legalized Freedom mentioned it, told me about it, and that's how I discovered it, through him. Now, it has some great stuff with the, some great sound effects, courtesy of the BBC Polyphonic Workshop, who, you know, was it, we were talking about John Carpenter last week and the synthesizers. But a lot of their soundtracks were like Blake Seven and Doctor Who and all their special effects sounds were a huge impression on people, you know, as much as bands like Hawkwind and stuff like that. Now, but I got thinking about something else, and this is a bit, bit a bit a bit odd, right? What a you know, that we know that the BBC polyphonic workshop was full of basically scientists creating audio soundtracks that were using tape loops around the room and stuff like that. Was the BBC Polyphonic Workshop also involved in nefarious things? Playing thing, doing things with sounds to affect the viewer's consciousness without them knowing it, more than just doing soundtracks. Because that's what I started thinking when the guy Peter was going on about it's a new form of recording technology that could be, you know, I was thinking subliminals and I was wondering, is Nigel Neal telling us about the funny going ons that we never hear about at the BBC Polyphonic Workshop? You know, apart from making soundtracks and special effects for TV shows, 
were they ever involved in any nefarious subliminal sound, you know, by oral beats carry on to try and hypnotize people and things like that. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. And, you know, I came out of watching the stone tape with a conspiratorial mentality now towards the BBC Polythonic Workshop. Well, if they were, what would be the best place to do that would be the test card. Yeah. And when did they put the test card on? They put that on in between programs just before, usually uh, it came on at night before the TV shut down. It came on early in the morning, but it also would come on in the afternoons in between the programs for about 15 minutes. So say about quarter to three and then something would start at three o'clock and Myself, I used to stare at that bloody thing, hypnotised by it, the music or the beep, the long, monotonous, yeah. monotonous um, beep. And was that putting your brain into some kind of um, alpha wave, ready for when the programming came on alpha so it waves, yeah. got in deep inside? Yeah, so that's one for the viewers and that's one for us who are hocus folk tights, is that maybe it's time to take a cynical look at the BBC Polyphonic Workshop as being something more than possibly a, you know, a soundtrack creation place where they involve an audiomancy, where they involved in a, a kind of a, a hypnotic magic creating sounds to affect human consciousness. I can think of one example of watching a documentary about the BBC's 19, the 76 Queen's Jubilee. And as she was moving through the crowds in London, going down the mall from Buckingham Palace, you could distinctly hear, we love you. We love you. We said over and over again. And I said to my parents, do you hear that? And they go, hear what? There's a, there's, there's a voice in the background going, we love you really slowly. Oh, I don't hear that. Well, you know, as you're hearing changes when you get older. So anyone who was under 20 or a teenager or younger, when they're watching that video, was hearing, we love you. And that was going on at the same time. The sex business of God Save the Queen is number one in the charts and the growing cynicism of the royal family and what they really represented. And did they create a subliminal soundtrack to go over the news TV broadcast directly targeting people under 20 so they would actually love the royal family. And was the BBC workshop involved in that? They do it with advertising, don't they? They put subliminals in the advertising, buy me, buy me. And that was banned in America. The, the, when they found out how, it was, how big that was, even Americans, where you would think they would let it happen in advertising, they actually banned it. But because the BBC doesn't have advertising, because it has this belief of anti beeb is this altruistic thing that gives you great stuff for nothing, there would be regard, subliminals are banned regarding advertising. But I don't know if they're banned regarding broadcasts, especially non commercial public broadcasts. I don't think if they were, even if they were banned, would the government mouthpiece like that bother them? No, They're not at all. Or aren't they? They're above the law. They're so. above. The law. I often think of like you know during the Rona lockdown, the banging thing, the bank pot bangers they had in England and in, in the all around, they had them in Northern Ireland too. In the UK, during the Thursday nights during the Rona lockdowns, that to me was a classic example of BBC mind control in action. I mean, how they got them to basically do that. Yeah, that was I remember that every every Thursday, every Thursday because it was a very quite a hot summer, and every Thursday it would be the same thing in our house. I would um, go to the window very dramatically and shut it with a right slam, and close the curtains and give it the V sign. Yep, <laughs> and I remember in the middle of it, uh, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, was supposed to have gotten the Rona, and he was on. We were being told he was on death's door. And when does he re come out of the hospital? On Good Friday. Right. I mean, the whole thing was staged. It was clear. We know, and we know what a kind of a monster he is now that the whole thing was staged. And so, 
you know, they talk about, you know, it really goes to show you that what Aldous Huxley said, that people would learn to love their slavery in the future, and it would be done by means of entertainment. And the BBC is a classic example of it. But I'm very interested now in why, you know, I bet Niall, N Nigel Neal had some good stories about the BBC if he walked out on them like that. There must be some good stuff. Uh, he must have some good dirt on them where to, to, to actually do that on them. It's it's interesting how they didn't want to do quite a mass four because that's his most most powerful one, the ringstone round and the stone circles and the alien force harvesting people. That's his darkest and most powerful story of all. I think it was a culmination of his life's work, and that should have been you know maybe the BBC were like mm, too close you know use the way the aliens use sound to harvest the lay lay to harvest the hippies. It makes you wonder if that was like the baby. Some of the baby says, well, well, we're doing this. <laughs> I think a lot of people have got something on the BBC and they're afraid to speak out, aren't they? And those that have spoken out, they've, um, they're not here anymore. Well, there you go, the smear campaigns. I mean, just look how, look at the, well, the, the Savile thing, how so few of them have gone forward. And you think they would all be, and a lot of them have been people who, the only, like I can remember the only person I ever heard that said he was evil before it all happened was Bill Oddie from the Goodies. And remember, he had a very popular series of uh, wildlife programs, bird watching. Well, they, 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 he was basically disappeared off the air for it too. And, and Jill, look at Jill Dando. Well, yeah, I mean... Uh, she and that knew. Was, absolutely. That's a whole other kettle of worms by itself. I'm sure the comment section on this on this. The night show will be on absolute fire, absolute fire. So that's it. That was this week's film, The Stone Tape. Nigel Neal, nineteen seventy two, BBC. Uh, definitely worth watching. You will, you will enjoy it. If not for the nostalgic element, but there's also, it, you know, it makes you think. full of psychic grime transcendental dirt and other kinds of spiritual uncleanliness and to help us deal with that and fight against that and come out refreshed sparkling like a head and shoulders ad on the other side here comes Sarah with the psychic hygiene In this fast-paced, technological-driven age, our lives are constantly inundated with information and notifications and digital distractions. Ping, ping, ping. It's no wonder that sometimes we feel overwhelmed and anxious and mentally exhausted. And that's where a digital detox comes in to give your mind and your psyche a much-needed break. So you could start by choosing a specific time that works for you. And it could be a full day, a relaxing weekend, or even just a few hours each day. And the aim is to set aside this dedicated period to unplug and disconnect from electronic devices like smartphones and tablets and computers. And during the digital detox, try to make an effort to limit your use of these devices so turn off unnecessary notifications that constantly interrupt you and resist the urge to mindlessly scroll through social media or endlessly check in emails and instead direct your attention to activities that connect you with the physical world and the people around you. Go for a walk and allow yourself to be fully present in your own surroundings. Spend some quality time with loved ones engaging in meaningful conversations and creating some memories and rediscover the joy of reading a physical book, feeling the texture of the pages as you turn them and get lost in the story without any distraction of the digital screens. And while some may find it necessary to use technology for work or essential tasks, 
during the detox, just try to keep it to a minimum and set clear boundaries and stay focused on the specific tasks at hand while avoiding unnecessary browsing or getting lost in the digital abyss. At the end of your digital detox, just take a bit of time to notice how it made you feel. Did you experience a sense of mental clarity or a reduction in anxiety or a newfound presence in the present moment? Hold on to any positive changes and insights that have occurred during your tech-free time. I've banned devices from the bedroom. I don't look at them after a certain time at night unless I'm, I'm, I'm working or doing some research. But the result for me is better sleep and waking up much more refreshed and productive. So a digital detox is not just about temporarily disconnecting from the digital world. It's about creating a deeper appreciation for the analog realm and looking after not only your psychic well-being, but your mental health as well. So stepping away from the constant influx of digital noise, you can create space for new ideas and perspectives, insights and clarity. So unplug, unwind and let your psychic senses recalibrate. And that's my psychic hygiene suggestion for this week. Thank you, Sarah. I agree 1,000 million percent about that. It's so important. I know one man who's dis disabled and because of his disability can't go out and he has a detox at home because he can't go walk in the woods. So he does all that. He shuts off everything that's digital and he reads a book or he does a little watercolor sketch or plays a musical instrument or something like that. There's loads of ways around it. I have a very funny story about this. A few months ago, I was in my local pub and I was talking to a barman and his wife or the owners were behind the counter. And I was telling them about, they were saying that the daughter was there. Uh, on constantly on the phone and I says have you ever heard of a digital detox and he says what's that and I'm saying to him it's like when you have nothing to do with anything that's uh, digitally brought in and that includes things like streaming movies and his wife interjects oh it's a good thing you still have all those VHS porno tapes in the attic <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was brilliant. But yeah, I can't agree. Whatever either. helps, whatever helps. I can't yeah, I, 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 it was just so quick the way she came out with it. But yeah, I I, I agree a hundred and ten percent. So we're going to talk about a different aspect of the BBC now, and I'm going to mention a man that doesn't really need much introduction. Um and that's Jimmy Savile. And I want to talk about back when he died. Now, when he died, everybody hailed him as a national treasure. So they paraded his coffin through the streets and it was almost like it was the Pope or something. And the flag-waving crowds seemed hypnotised by this hero, not knowing the sinister truth that you see behind the facade of a national treasure. He was one of the BBC's main black magicians engaging in dark deeds and many within the BBC and even the police knew about his actions and it was an open secret. Sadly those he abused were unheard or too afraid to speak out yet he was still celebrated in the public and waved off as a cherished figure. When the truth finally emerged the flag wavers were shocked and ashamed and they vowed never to let it happen again. But fast forward to today, 2023, and the scandals keep coming from both the BBC and even ITV. And each star that's exposed as a deviant, to put it mildly, was always once seen as a national treasure before their true colours were revealed. And it's really disheartening to see people not learning from past mistakes and continuing to idolise these so-called mouthpieces and talking heads as if they were their friends. The reality is far from it. These individuals would never care about you and they're only care concerned with their own image and agenda, yet people seem to forget and fall for the charismatic charm that they portray 
time and time again. And it's a sad cycle, the public getting enthralled by these false idols, only to be disappointed and disgusted when the truth comes out. Yes, uh, I have, you know, a long history with the Savile phenomena thing, even on a very Fortean sense with the VON broadcast from back, you know, 10 years ago, wherever it was. And we had the funny, strange sounds. We had our own stone tape on the on the show broadcast. It's, it's, I never, as a kid, got the appeal of Savile. And I never even understood why someone would want to watch Jim will fix it. I, I, he was just a monster to me, even as a child. I can remember even when I was a teenager watching Top of the Pops, and I was going, not this, effing, you know, fruit again, this grape, you know, this kind of thing. And you just want to watch the bands and stuff. And I never understood his colossal power and ratings. It, and he also had political power. He seemed to be very close to politicians, royal family. He spent something like nine Christmases with Margaret Thatcher. And for me, the one that always gets me is I absolutely believe he was a com an accomplice in the one, at least one of the Yorkshire Ripper murders and probably tallied around, kept them road shotgun with Sutcliffe as he was going around killing these women in, in, in Yorkshire back in the 70s. And, you know, when I came with this theory first years ago, I was trashed for it. And one of the things I used as kind of like, well, evidence was a photograph of him looking exactly like Maura Hindley. And uh, the before that, he initially used to have dark hair when he came out of wrestling and DJing. And then he just dyed his hair into two-tone, black and white, which I find very interesting for back in the 60s, someone looked like that. And then the publicity shots have these exactly the, the, the haircut as Maura Hindley. And I remember, I used to get trashed on this on like skeptics groups. This guy actually is claiming that Jimmy Savile modeled his image on Maura Hindley. And lo and behold, when Louis Thoreau was interviewing in a very famous program, Jimmy Savile, he asked him about Moira Hindley, and he goes, I am the Moira Hindley story. Now, I know you have a theory that he probably might have actually even encountered her when he was a DJ at the old BBC, Pop, Top of the Pop Studios in Manchester. Yeah, not only there, but also in Bellevue, um, which was just across the road from where they lived. There was um, a fun fair, fairground kind of entertainment place there, and he had a dance hall there as well. And a lot of um, a couple of the children that were picked up were from there and would frequent that fairground as well. And that's where Leslie Ann Downey was going on the day that they lifted her, and he had a dance hall up there. So there's no way that their paths wouldn't have crossed. It's just not possible. I think there's many people are still unable to face just how dark he might he probably was, just how deep down into the gutter of depravity he actually went. And he got away with it for two things. Charity work, the usual cover story, and his a zany image. The zany image, you know, oh, jingle jangle jingle, you know, all this kind of thing. And you know, no, then no, then you know, all this kind of thing. And that was all sleight of hand. It was all distraction. You know, it was all like I often wondered about that BBC TV show, Jim will fix it. You know, it was obviously a lot of it was staged to help people like up and coming bands, actors, whatever, who had lost their profile, probably paid that show or got favors done for them. And what I what I remember was that the Chancellor of the Exchequer in England. And little kid goes, I'd like to meet the Chancellor of the Exchequer. What nine-year-old kid in the world wants to meet the Chancellor of the Exchequer? They want to meet Superman. They want to meet Batman. They want to meet Steve Austin, the $6 million man. They don't want to meet the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And that was obviously staged. It turned out a lot of these kids were actually recruited out of RADA, the children's acting stage thing. It was all a big fix. You know, literally, it was when he said Jim will fix it, it literally meant that. The show was a huge fix. And the the medals handed out and everything. It was just it was just so bizarre, so strange. 
And then he wrote books on the time he was at while he was molesting children. He wrote books on child care. You know, this is incredible stuff and how parents, he's a guy who was a pedophile. He was writing books on child care and they're being published. He was writing books on his relationship with God while he was involved in the most depraved behaviors. And they were they were out there, these books and on and on in this charity work and everything. And uh, even now talking about him, I'm feeling my nervous system changing. Whatever he was, he wasn't human. There was something behind there. Now, my theory is that like Ian Brady, the, his mysterious past, I think Savile's the same. When he talked about the Duchess, his mother being the Duchess, I think she was. I think she was It's the, it's the daughter of some duke. And they look after their own bloodlines, even if they're working class, they they have their seed that they take care of and things like this. They know the Rothschilds have done this kind of thing. They go looking for the illegitimate children and take care of them, no matter what family they're in and what social class they're in. And he definitely was of that. He, um, it You know, it's just amazing to me that there was no accountability over it, except the uh, there was no one in the BBC came forward really and opened up the books on everything. And this, they were, not, were talking about a, an organization whose headquarters in Shepherd's Bush in London has huge statues of children. And this is not a joke. If you don't know this, you don't believe me, look it up. Children involved in sexual erotic acts with adults naked. Look it up. A few years ago, some guy tried to smash them with a hammer and he got arrested. But the BBC still refuses to take those statues down because they're, they're, they're heritage, they're artistic. And the artist, I believe, that actually made them was a, was, a, was a nonce himself. So, I mean, I have a friend who used to work for the BBC and he said, and he, he was like in the audio department or something, that, not the polyphonics, but he was in like the technical end of the things. And he told me some of the stories are hilarious. Like there was one, they were all like friends. They would all get jobs for each other. You know, it's all our friends from Cambridge University. And one guy was paid a huge salary to sit there all day and listen to Radio 1. And so that's what his job was. He would sit in his office and he would listen to Radio 1. And his job, his alleged, alleged job, was to pretend what uh, that he was checking the signal to make sure that he was checking the signal, that there was no fluctuation in the signal quality, which is nonsense anyway, because he was in London. He was under the bloody transmitter. It would never, never happen. But it was just the, the jobs for the boys. And he said they were all creepy. They were all creeps. They were all aristocratic creeps from Oxbridge universities, mainly Cambridge, who were given like basically, you know, what the mafia call no-show jobs, where they pay the salary to show up and pretend they do something. And this is what the license fee was paid for. So... The license, and this is another thing, it's like they never seem to have any qualms about the license fee. Like, for instance, it's like, oh, yeah, we know Jimmy Savile was a pedophile. Some people believe he was a serial killer and blah, 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 blah. We did awful things. We, we can confirm that he had sex with dead bodies in Leeds Hospital and that he he, he wheeled dead, they used to wheel dead corpses around on wheelchairs and in, in, in races. But, you know, we still want our, a license fee. And I find that amazing that th it's almost like the license fee itself is some kind of course that you're subjected to. It's some kind of hex. Yes, you, you're literally paying, paying for the black magic, aren't you? You're paying for the spell to be put upon you on all this depravity and you're paying for it. And why should you have to pay to subscribe? Because you need, you need you don't to, want because in black magic the you have to grant permission. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you you why you, you subscribe and pay for something that you don't want in order to be able to watch the other free channels that you might want to watch. And if you don't have a license, then they send in the licensing company, which is the third party company that will harass you. Um and that allows um the BBC to distance itself from the dirty work and the bullying tactics that it uses to collect the money from the people that it harasses. And 
I don't have a license myself. I've not had one since 20, 2014. And every two years, I have to tick a box online and send it back to say that I still don't require a license. And this year, I thought I'd just push it and see what happens because my aerial is not connected to the TV. So the, the, it's just, it's not even like I can just whip it out quick. It's it's not connected. And uh, I thought I'd push it and not send it back. And I didn't send it back. And I must have got three letters a week from this licensing company threatening me telling me they were going to send the bailiffs in they were going to come round I could go to prison I could have a um, thousand pound fine and all this and I thought well come round you're not coming in but I don't watch the bloody tv so why should I have to prove to you that I don't need your service and I left it and I left it for about six months and um the next thing they were telling me that the bailiffs were going to come round or the police, somebody was going to come round. Nobody came round. And eventually these letters, they just started to get on my nerves. And I thought, all I've got to do is tick this box and it'll go away. Do I really want the wolf at the door? So after six months, I uh, ticked the box and said, still don't need a license. And the letters just stopped. They didn't even want to come round and have a look to see why you know why I didn't do that six months earlier? They just stopped. As they call, so they were never going to come round. As they call it, you know, a legal operation of a television set, uh, and 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 I would, but the whole the whole the whole the whole idea is to terrorize old ladies who think they're going to go to prison and have their cats taken off them and stuff like that. It's pure evil. They in 1952 they launched this thing called the TV detector ban which was basically a van that had nothing inside it. And it had a thing on the roof that looked like a science fiction machine. And they used to run all the ads. TV detector vans are operating in your area. If you are legally operating a television set without a license, we will come and get you. And there was even videos that showed heavies coming out of a van, like, you know, like SS troops coming out of the back of the van. It, the, the, you know, number 26 on Hawthorne Road doesn't have a TV. Let's right, lads, let's go. This kind of, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. And uh, I remember one of the videos they showed, like, start off with a TV detective vans up, and they show, like, uh, the north of England again, maybe some kind of place where you live in the 1970s with smoke still coming out of the chimney and a sea of television aerials, as if to say, oh, we, you know, we know how to get you. And that ran until the 2000s, that those ads ran, and they still made those, those fake vans. They used to drive around the neighborhoods terrorizing old ladies. And uh, oh, and for what? For Samuel. Yeah. So, for Samuel. When I was um, doing the research for the book about the TV license, um, I read some information. It was about Jonathan Ross. And prior to leaving the BBC in 2010, Jonathan Ross had clocked up earnings of about £18 million over three years. And it, it got leaked out into the public. And the excuse from the BBC was that it was the market and not the BBC who dictated Ross's worth. And then at the same time this was going on, the BBC considered the poor people um, who were actually being incarcerated or threatened because they couldn't afford to pay the licence Um they had no bother about that, no qualms. And the response to that was that the poor people consume much more TV than any other demographic. And therefore, the punishment was justifiable because they should pay the license fee more than anybody else. Um, and so going to prison in the BBC's eyes was a fair punishment for the people who couldn't afford the license for not having the money to pay the license. John Roth, poor father, that is that. He talks like it's marvelous. Was it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, he can't say he's ours. Yeah, he was also involved in a scandal with Russell Brand again, where they called up Andrew Sachs, who played Manuel in Faulty Towers, and Russell Brand said he had, had anal sex with his daughter, granddaughter. I remember that, yes. Yeah. And, and they, all, they got away with it. Yeah, like some kind of frat boys they were behaving like, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And they're both BBC darlings still. Uh, 
didn't Jonathan Ross go over to ITV or has he gone back to the BBC? I'm I'm out, I'm out of I, date. I don't know. I always remember he was Mr. BBC though. Yeah. But all that, like you say, was for Savile and 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 people like him. And on top of that, you had the terror terror campaigns of public service announcements. Do you remember them? Charlie says, I am the I am the spirit of dark and lonely waters. And they'd be on Saturday morning during the kids' programs. And the thing I think once, think twice, think bike. The whole thing was designed to frighten the shite out of you. Uh, and to make you feel that the world was a dangerous place and danger was everywhere. And you see like the health and safety world that came after that, that they were planning that then to make the average person be a pussy, basically. Yeah, there was a clunk click every trip. That was Savile. I think Savile was behind that yeah. one. That was for the seatbelt in the car. Um, yeah. Charlie Says, which was awful. And the, the prodigy did a song with that, yeah. didn't they? Do you remember? With the cat. Um, yeah. yeah, and Stranger Danger was another one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if he had it in Ireland, but there was the rabbit Tufty. Tufty and friends crossing the road and one of the little rabbits always got run down. No, I didn't know that one. That Ooh. was quite traumatising. Yeah, one of the little puppets would get run down by the ice cream because he'd be running for an ice cream. The ice cream van would turn up and he wouldn't look across the road and uh, this little puppet would end up getting mowed down by a car. And I remember that. I can still see that. Do you Awful. remember the uh, changing the subject a little bit? Uh, the urban the urban legend around Captain Pugwash. Do you remember that one? Is it true that? No, it's not, unfortunately. That was a Swedish pornographic cartoon. Uh, that they took all the pornographic bits out and made a children's cartoon and kept names like Seaman Stains and Master Bates and things like that. <laughs> Sadly <laughs> it wasn't true, but it's a good it was a good story. <laughs> I can say I don't recall it, but then I wouldn't have even if it had been in there, I wouldn't have known what yeah. that was then back then. So, and then um, there'd be like you're saying with the rabbit, but then there'd be in between like lovely things like Ivor the Engine or Bagpuss, like really beautiful programming. This is how they worked. You got this beautiful stuff like Bagpuss, absolutely the most sweetest thing possible. And Ivor the Engine, and then, you know, Stranger Danger, you know, something like that. You know, I, I am the spirit of dark and lonely waters, you know. It's typical psychological terror tactics, though, isn't it? They put yep. the squeeze on, and then they release, and then they put the squeeze back on, so you're confused. And um, you kind of don't view the um, sinister stuff as sinister as it actually is, because you've got back puss in your mind, and it, so it can't be um, yeah. evil. You know, yeah. I watched um today this afternoon. I watched a documentary on YouTube about Savile, which was quite quite um. It was all about his victims, and it was it was it was quite deep. And I'll just tell you a story from it. Uh, going back to um, Jim will fix it. One of the abused boys had come on to this this uh, documentary in his 30s 40s when this documentary was made and he was one of the boy scouts on Jim will fix it um they I forget what they've been able to do I think they'd gone to see the racing cars and it was a group oh, I, of boys I, I think I remember what it was they went on a roller coaster eating their lunch remember that no 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 it wasn't that one no oh, it, okay. it was a uh, it was um they'd gone to see I think Ayrton Senna or something like that at the races. They'd gone to the races, and they come back to the studio. These boys, uh, the boy must have been about eight years old, and they were all expecting their own Jim will fix it badge, and they'd all he got them all on stage. And what he'd done was he got one Jim will fix it badge, but put a big red ribbon around it. So he'd put one and tied the ribbon around the group of boys. So they were all a bit disappointed because. They were all looking forward to getting this badge. You know, they were Boy Scouts and, you know, they live for badges, don't they? So um, he said that Savile had said to him, if you want your own badge, come with me. I'll go and get you one from my dressing room. So um, off, off he goes. He's eight years old and off he goes. And 
Um, I don't need to explain what happened while he was in there. But um, the dressing room is kind of next door to the studio. And this boy, or he's a man now, he was telling the story. And he said another man came in. And he said this other man was worse than Savile was. And Savile had actually had to say to this man, you know, get off him, stop it after a while. And um, as I was, I'm thinking, I wonder who that could be. I wonder who that could be. So I started um, doing a bit of research and I came across the name Ray Terrett. And he is he's dead now. Um, he died, I think, last year. Oh, he, he, from BBC, he was one of the original BBC Radio 1 DJs. And he was arrested several times for doing things like this. But what's interesting is he lived in um, Manchester for a while and he did a talent. He went, he entered a talent show at the Palace Theatre that Jimmy Savile used to run to find singers and talent. And he won a talent show there. And apparently, him and this is before the BBC, um, apparently, um, uh, they hit it off and this Ray moved in with Savile and they shared a flat in Salford while Savile was doing his dance hall work and that. And Savile got him a job um, down at Radio 1 and he became one of the original lineup for the Radio 1 DJs, this Ray Terrett. It's T-E-R-E-T. And um, when I was reading about him, they became best friends and he became Savile's chauffeur. And he became his um, personal assistant and did everything for him. And I thought it had to be him. Yeah. It must have been him. Back in the 70s, Savo made a big deal of having a Rolls Royce with a freezer in the back. The back, the what we call the booth, what Americans call the trunk, had been converted into a deep freeze. And he had those magazine shoots of them with all bottles of champagne to make it make out that it was a party mobile that's that was for the bodies i'm convinced of it that would they would kept the bodies in that that's what i think that was and your man was in on it rick uh, parafit and francis rossi from status quo were interviewed years later about him and they says oh yeah we knew all about it we knew everything and they go uh we couldn't say anything because he had the gangsters the, all the criminal cr- criminal gangs in manchester and needs and he'd be killed they'd ha- he'd have you killed and it turns out that's how he protected himself in a big way. Gangsters. He had gangsters in Morecambe, in Leeds, and in um, Manchester who looked after him. And if anyone gave him any problem, they were the boys were sent around and it was made sure. And, they, you know, they would kill people and stuff like that. It does make you wonder how many people he has actually had killed. Well, the famous thing of the Ripper tape uh, where he had Weirside Pete, uh, I, you know, over the years that I've said, I'm convinced that Savile's voice on there, even though a guy came forward and said it was him. I don't believe it was him. I, it's like, you know, any policeman will tell you that when there's a thing like that, loads of fakes come forward, cranks to say it was me. You know, it's a weirdo to say it's me. That's Savile's voice on that when you listen to that, putting on. Is that the, the voice that went? Pumped through the shopping malls and yes. through the streets. Yes. With the, the Newcastle voice. accent. On a cassette single by Andrew Gold. Now, cassette singles back in the 70s were not sold in the shops. They were only given to DJs because they would put them into the machine. Now, here's the new single by Andrew Gold. And you, you snap it into the play machine. You could not buy cassette singles until well into the 80s that were that rad- readily available. Especially someone like Andrew Gold wasn't that big of a star in this part of the world. That was recorded over an Andrew Gold tape. It was it was Savile like deliberately mocking, putting on a, a fake Geordie accent or a Sunder a Sunderland accent uh, on it. Clear as day, it's him. It's definitely him. And then this guy comes, this nut job comes forward, and these they say, oh, it's, you know, looking for attention. And they, oh yeah, there we got the guy who did it. It's just incredible stuff. And like he was taunting the victims, and the fact that. It, that that that's what I this is why this is as dark as it gets, Sarah. That the Western South Yorkshire police chose to play in the middle. You could be in a pub, in anywhere, you know, Huddersfield, Leeds, York, Sheffield, whatever, and then they stopped the music in the pub, and then they would play that tape. Mm-hmm. 
Now that is like it's sick as it gets. They would stop factories in the afternoon. A factory would stop working, and the auspices was, well, maybe you recognise the voice, but it wasn't. It was a big, dark, black magic monstrosity, the tra trauma, and all the women, and it destroyed loads of families because half the women, not half the women, but a sizable number of women back then would start thinking their boyfriends or husbands were the ripper. I know. Was, yeah. They would have to. Does your husband make strange movements? You know. Is he a truck driver? And they'd be like, maybe my husband is the ripper. They did untold damage to relationships with that. The um, a lot of a lot of the husbands around here were were called in for questioning. A friend of mine, um, her husband, I mean, because he did look like him. I mean, he did. He had he had the curly hair and the mustache, and he did. It was a bit of a joke afterwards. He looked like him, you know. Um, but at the time. He wasn't funny when he got no god he got all in for questioning, especially them when they were stitching up fellas for IRA bombings who were nowhere, nowhere like Birmingham Six and all this. The police were very happy to stitch innocent people up back then. Another one was Leslie Joe Rimmer. She was found in the canal at Hepton Bridge in Yorkshire, and uh, they, she was found. Uh, she was a thirteen or fourteen. She went to her at the trades club. To, and then her mother sent her to the shop. She left the shop and was never... Then her body was found later on in the canal, having been beaten to death. And she... They they literally made a suspect of every single man in Hebden Bridge, except who? Jimmy Savile, who was living right beside where she was killed. And even the vicar at Hebden Bridge said, you tortured and terrorised every man in this town trying to make out they'd murdered this girl, Leslie Jo Rimmer, when Savile was literally living next door to where she was killed. Now, that's how bad it got. How, you know, this is, the, you know, Savile is like a character from the most intense horror film, a horror novel you could imagine in real life. In real life. Yeah. Uh, just going back to that documentary, a couple of other people had come on who he'd abused and they were telling the stories and um, he was a proper predator because he would be nice as pie with you in the public or outside his caravan. And the minute he got you inside, it was like he just something came over him and it wasn't it was seconds hadn't even passed. And he was a, a monster, a monster. Ginny Savile, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gin, yeah. 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 Absolute monster. And he used to, um, with his caravan, he used to drive around in that. And he was, um, in this one particular instance, he'd gone to a hotel in Jersey. I think the town was called Hellier in Jersey. Yeah. Would pat, He was in this hotel in Jersey and he would pat, he didn't stay in the hotel yet. He was hanging around the hotel, ingratiating himself on the guests. And he parked his caravan at the front door where the, it led to the beach waiting for the young girls to come out so he could pop outside his caravan and uh, get them to go in. He was literally a, a predator in every sense of the word. Like he couldn't help himself. It was something else. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, Jimmy Savile, if there is one person who represents what the BBC is in terms of the topic we're talking about tonight, I think it's absolutely him. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your four-leaf clovers and grab your Renfield Rain Max. Whether it's raining cats and banshees or the sun is shining like a pot of gold, our favourite Irish weatherman has got you covered. It's Thomas with the Psychic Weather. Current psychic weather is pretty clear. It's Renfielding and babbling and hysteria. It seems to be this mass hysteria at the moment, not just among the Renfields, but also the Normies. In the wake of the death of the pop star Sinead O'Connor, I think a lot of these people seem to have some kind of weird existential crisis that it makes them realize that they won't live forever or something like that. But the reaction has been completely over the top and completely strange. I mean, 
Prince died and didn't get this level of adulation. And ironically, these people wouldn't, who were claiming to be super fans, only know one song. But having said that, it was very interesting to see that both the media and the public both ended up in this state of weird hysteria, bordering on the creation of a, a religion. And again, I think this is the this is a kind of a mortality rent feeling, an existential rent feeling, that they're actually the deaths of celebrities make them confront their own mortality, and as a result, their own lack of living a meaningful or engaging or creative life, and it suddenly frightens them because they see themselves in that position. So that's what the, the psychic weather is this week. This week, existential rent fielding caused by a sudden shock that they won't live forever. And that's a psychic weather at me, Thomas Sheridan. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I have noticed an absolute influx of posts about um, the death of Sinead O'Connor. Um, very, strange. very strange. I mean, I understand people have a an affection for music and memories of growing up and listening to things, uh, but these people know one song, ironically written by Prince, who got none of the same. And he was like, when he died, I don't think since Elvis, anyone that big died. And it's like Prince is dead, and that was the end of it. And uh, yeah, it's very peculiar, very odd, and uh, very unsettling, and shows how you know religions can be created around celebrities very easily. Uh, the last thing I could compare this thing to would be Diana, Princess Diana. The strange thing with this, though, is all the people who are posting about it. I've never noticed any posts about Sinead O'Connor prior to this. Nobody's shown their appreciation for her prior to her dying. So I don't know, but yeah, don't know. Yeah, well, that's it anyway. An exist Ren an ex Renfielding existential crisis. That's the way. Okay, continuing with the BBC high strangeness, uh, wickedness. Sarah brought my attention a while ago when we were writing the book to a TV programme called Threads from the 1980s. I've never seen it. I've heard about it. And I've seen reviews of it, and they said it's the most traumatizing piece of TV ever ever shown anywhere. And I, I didn't even want to watch it recently because everyone said it's unbelievably depressing and dark. And I even seen American videos reviewing it on YouTube saying it's the most horrific and traumatizing TV show ever made. So tell us about, you. did you see it while it was broadcasting at the time when you were growing up? Uh, no, I didn't, thankfully. I, I saw it as an adult, and that was enough. Um, it burns into your eyeballs. It's very depressing. It's very it's psychologically terrifying. Um, it's it's about the... There's some unrest um, to do with the Middle East, and it kind of starts with that, with the government, with the UK government and the American government kind of following this problem in the Middle East that could escalate to be um, a nuclear attack. And as that's going on, you've got, it keeps flashing back to um, life in a mill town in Sheffield. So you've got this like Northern um, kitchen sink drama going on alongside this with just Reese Reese Dinsdale's in it. Do you know him? No. no, right. He's in it. And um, the, all the usual actors that are in these kinds of Northern dramas, they're all in it. And it's set in the 80s, in 1984, I think it is. And um, they're just getting on with life, like a soap opera there, life in the mills and whatnot. And that's going on. And then eventually this uh, nuclear strike comes and everybody's out shopping in Sheffield, city centre on a Saturday afternoon about one o'clock when they look up and they see the mushroom cloud which is there and uh, then there's just pandemonium on the streets then it just all full-blown pandemonium and uh, people you literally see scenes of people wetting themselves with fear and things like this and you, you, you just think it's not going to get any more. It can't get any worse. And then it does because another one, another blast goes off. 
and this time we see um the effect of of the blast and we just see people melted um and cats melted and all kinds of horrible things like that um and and then after that we don't hear well obviously we don't hear about the the nuclear attack anymore it then goes straight into a nuclear winter and then it follows the survivors and how they survive for the next 10 years and it's just anarchy and lawlessness and just basically eating rats and what they can find and it is one of the worst films I've ever seen and I watched it um, not expecting that I watched it and I was awake for weeks afterwards. It would you'd go to bed, and it would come back in your mind, and you just like I found myself lying in bed till all hours of the night replaying these scenes in my mind, and it was awful. And you, it it played on your mind, and you'd start thinking, "What if this happened?" And then you'd have to get a grip of yourself and think, "Come on, yeah." I'm gonna send you off. Like, gonna like, send you like off what is it. what is the purpose of these shows? No, if that was a show like that, other than to frighten people, it's not going to stop nuclear proliferation. This whole thing of creating awareness, I've always thought that was the biggest lot of bullshit in the world. Like People don't need to see that because it's not a reality of their lives. It's almost like they were trying to kill people, get people to commit suicide and suffer from depression and all these kinds of things. You do. I, I did actually suffer, not depression, but I was miserable, so miserable for weeks afterwards. Just like, like I had the life sucked out of me. It was horrible. And it wasn't entertainment at all. It was, if that's entertainment, if people watch that for entertainment, then I don't, I, they must have the constitution of an ox because it floored me. Um, and even talking about it now, I can see, I can see the image of, um, there was a, a just, just people getting met, just ordinary working class people on a Saturday morning, Saturday early afternoon, just being melted it was it was just horrible 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 and even now i know it was a propaganda film like what we've been talking about i still couldn't watch that now no that's why i didn't watch it. i didn't want it it's it's amazing that the bbc hasn't done one on climate change like that where they show people in england being burnt by the sun and there's no water and i'm surprised they must be biting themselves just wanting to make something like that I hope they don't because uh, the the mindset of people now with all the programming and all the brainwashing and all the ideologies, I think they'd be mass suicides if they did that now. Well, they did it in real life with the Rona. Isn't the Rona a real life version? Wasn't the, the Rona a real life version of that? That they kept them all terrified in their houses of something they couldn't see. And uh, they had to do a little ritual to worship the state on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night with banging the pots. So they've actually got them to do it in real life. The power they have over the public now is colossal. Back in the 80s, they had very little power over the public that they do now. People might have watched it, but they wouldn't have obeyed the BBC necessarily, most of them. Now they will, and that's the frightening part. They can they basically own the population now. Yeah. He even had us singing happy birthday while he washed our hands. I mean, how much more infantile does it get? And people were doing it. And yeah. and, and you had you had adults needed to be told how to wash the hands properly. Incredible. So they gave them back to God that they took away from them. The religion they took away from them, they gave it back to them in the form of the the the, the pandemic met the scandemic, the lockdown measures, whatever, Rona measures. So well, we'll I will say this: the, um, the if you want to compare that to threads, um, the, the 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 fear that they, they peddled through the lockdowns and and things was quite tame in compared to the psychological terror that they pushed on what was what you thought you were watching was just a a Sunday afternoon movie drama, yeah, incredible, yeah, yeah. So that was the the grimoire of the BBC. If you live in other countries uh, and you're not aware of this, well, you probably have your own version of that as well. I know when America of this kind of carry on, this kind of like broadcast in spells. I know in America in the 80s, they had a, t a TV movie called The Day After, which was broadcast on, I think, all the channels on the same night. 
about something similar, a nuclear holocaust in uh, Kansas City. And it's it's but it's tame compared to dreads. I've seen I've seen bits of both and it's the American was is tame by comparison, even though it's quite frightening and dark. Uh, if you, you've missed out on anything, the the threads are, the comments are down, <laughs> the comment threads are down there for you to fill it up with. So that was the night show was a one theme show, something a bit different, something we both Sarah and I wanted to get off our chest, but also to show you that this we do live in a sea of sorcery, and by knowing these things and understanding these things is the best way to escape them. And now the part of the show where we talk about books that have influenced us and so on uh, from our Form 14 collection. My book this week, I absolutely love. I read it in one, two sittings, actually. And it's John A. The Laughters, H.R. Giger, H.P. Lovecraft, From Alien to the Abyss, Alchemist, Alch Alchemist Adventures in the Void. Now, both Lovecraft and Giger are you know, amongst our favorite topics on this show. What this book is, is the laughter takes a series of essays and thesis that they look like college papers on comparing the work of both Giger and Lovecraft. And, you know, it's it's full of great ideas and information. Very easy, easy to read. It's double space typed and typed out like a report paper in type typewriter font. And it's it's as I said, it's a collection of essays. So some of them there's actually a lot of overlap. So I was down, I, I was like on chapter six or something, and I was reading something that I'd already read on chapter one. So, but that's because they were all from some were submitted for articles. Some seem to be called I don't know college papers or whatever. But it's a great read. It's fabulous actually, and it's really interesting and it's really well written. And I learned a lot of new things about it, and I had its great comment in it saying that. H. H. R. Giger is the is the occultist that everyone wishes that Lovecraft was, and that's probably the best way to describe the book, because it's sort of like it ties in your 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 feelings about both. You know, they were quite different. Uh, Lovecraft was a kind of an American Yankee Tory. He wasn't into like women and stuff like that. Giger was a ladies' man. They were they were chalk and cheese. They were both so different. But yet, ultimately dealing with the same thing. They were both magicians that worked from their dreams and worked from their uh, visions of the same kind of cosmic future. Not necessarily that dark, but the whole idea of a universe being a, you know, it's not personal. It's nothing like that. Just this is the way things are. But uh, we know that Necronomicon did influence Giger and, and that kind of thing. But it also has great references to how they both felt about Crowley, uh, things like Clive Barker talking about them, and so on. So I highly recommend H.R. Giger, H.P. Lovecraft, From Alien to the Abyss, Alchemical, Alchemist Adventures in the Void, by John A. The Laughter. Strange name, it's probably just a pen name. But there you go. That's my book this week. Do you think they would have gotten on together? No, God. I, not in a million years. Maybe <laughs> towards the end of Lovecraft's life, I don't know. But no. I mean, it's got some funny stuff in about it. It's got lots of Lovecraft's private papers in it, coded, and some of the stuff he said about Harry Houdini was like he called him a, a bimbo and everything. So I can only imagine how he would have felt about Giger. My book this week is called The Soul of the Octopus by Cy Montgomery. And um, it's an exploration of the mysterious octopus mind. And it's a book that takes you on a personal and scientific journey of this lady into the octopus world through her experiences with them. And she writes about the importance of recognising the sentience of all living beings and having an appreciation for the diversity of life on Earth. She puts the point across that octopuses possess this unique form of consciousness, which we know about, and that they're very different from our own um, consciousness. And she uh, goes into the problem-solving skills and how amazing they are and that they can open jars and navigate mazes and adapt to new challenges, making us kind of rethink what it means to be intelligent 
And as we discussed last week, she talks about how they don't have a centralised brain, but they've got a distributed nervous system that allows them to change colours and patterns. And they've got a huge range of emotions and intentions, almost like they've got their own language. And it also talks about the social interactions and how complex they are and how complex they can be when it comes to courtship and mating and it's just a really nice book and it's almost like a diary and it takes you through all the dives that she does to go down there and see them um and there's some nice color photographs in there as well and what what actually kind of got me was in the corner of the pages I don't know if you can see there, but there is a little photograph on each page of an octopus and it moves on each. So when you flick the page, the octopus is kind of moving, which animated, that's clever. Sort of draws you in. But yeah, this lady's got an, an affinity with, with octopus and um, she goes down to the bottom, bottom of the sea to go and see them. And she thinks they're highly intelligent and um, it's written kind of from a, sci a, a marine scientific point of view, uh, also memoirs and also there's some philosophy in there. So octopus philosophy. So whether you're familiar or unfamiliar with the octopus and all its intrigue, um, it's just a book that'll just leave you wanting more and probably want to learn all about them. What year did that come out? It's a fairly new book. Um, it came out... 2015. It's, it's a nice one. Not so much Fortean, but it just kind of compares our consciousness with that of an octopus. Oh, it sounds great. And we do have an affiliate. We're like the Richard and Judy book club here now. We do have an affiliate link. If you can just tell people about that, please, Sarah. Yes, if ever, uh, if you want to purchase any of the books that we review, I will put the affiliate links into the description so you can, if you choose, you can go and buy them via our affiliate links. And it just means that we get um, a few pens from the sale of each book that goes into the pot and helps us uh, to pump it back into the into the show and into the respective channels. So that would be great. Well, that's tonight's show. Thank you again, Sarah. It was a bit different, but I'm glad we did it. It was uh, very interesting and it took us in a different direction. I hope you enjoyed it too, or at least not, maybe not enjoyed it, but got a lot from it. I want to thank everybody, as does Sarah, for your incredible feedback and support of the show and to keep sharing the program and keep liking. And don't forget to join our Twitter page and also, our, we have merchandise on the Hocus Focus merchandise link, which is below. And Sarah is now showing the new the mug. Uh, and look how snazzy that is. You're like a uh, Vanna White on the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> now, Sarah. Not, not yeah. the BBC version, though, the Hocus Focus version. Yeah. The, the, yeah. And. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, for that. And uh, the next week's program, episode three of season two, will be on Sarah on that Eni's channel. So don't forget, you have to subscribe there. And on Sarah's channel is also the playlist for the entire show right back to the first one. What's the actual number of this show, Sarah? Do you know off the bat? We've started again, haven't we, with season two. So this would be... Um episode two so you've now got the even numbers but if you wanted to look at it as the total it would be episode 25 this 25 that's incredible okay we're quarter of a century so uh yeah so thanks everybody yeah we'll, we'll be one year old in january gosh we packed a lot in a year didn't we yeah, we did we did and I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated in the live chat last week. That was an absolute blast seeing everybody dive into that party and rabbit hole together, exchanging ideas and theories, and just having a really good time. And I hope, well, we hope those connections continue to flourish and grow into some fantastic friendships. 
and you guys are the heart and soul of this 40 and community so a big virtual hug and heartfelt thank you for being a part of this 40 and tribe and as ever spread the word far and wide and tell your friends and family and even that quirky skeptical neighbor or work colleague of yours let's keep this 40 and party going strong now, Sarah, uh, for myself and the Hocus Pocus, what is this week's card? This week's card is the Hermit. And the Hermit is a ninth card in the deck and shows an elderly bearded man dressed in long robes, holding a staff in one hand and a lantern in the other. And he treads on his path. And the lantern's light is very significant because it doesn't reveal the entire journey, but only a few steps ahead. And that reminds us that we need to take one step at a time and trust that the way forward will become clearer as we move forward. And that not everything is meant to be revealed all at once and that that's okay. And in his left hand, which is the side representative of the subconscious mind, he holds a long staff which is a symbol of his power and authority. And I see this as his way of maintaining balance and guiding himself along his solitary journey. He's relying on his own inner strength and intuition to find the right direction. And the card is all about inter introspection, solitude and inner guidance. And the hermit seeks knowledge and enlightenment through this self-reflection. And he's withdrawn from the distractions of the outside world to focus on his inner self, seeking answers and understanding. Now, this upcoming week, it may be time for some introspection and soul searching. And some of you might find yourself seeking solitude or feeling drawn to intro perspective activities. And this is a perfect time to reflect on your past experiences and any lessons they might have brought you might feel the need to spend time alone, stepping away from the daily routine, from shopping, cleaning and not being able to be everything to everybody all the time. And this period allows you to think about your life's purpose, direction and values. The presence of the hermits could also mean a desire to isolate yourself, to heal from a challenging situation. You might find yourself in an antisocial phase, feeling less inclined to engage with others compared to your usual self. And you might find that you just want to focus on your own needs and be alone for a while. And it may be a good week to delve into reading books that offer deeper insights or that feed your brain and inspire you. However, it can also mean the emergence from a time of solitude which might have been necessary to come back from a past heartache or a tough breakup so that you're prepared for a fresh start. And it might also suggest a period of celibacy or chastity. And it's important to allow this solitary recovery time after a breakup, whether it's from a relationship, a job, a belief, or a massive change in general. It's always important to grieve and process it before moving on, because by doing this, you'll be much better prepared for when a new beginning or opportunity finally does present itself. Romantically, the hermit could indicate having an older, wiser partner, and it might also be a gentle push to make more effort to connect with your partner. Perhaps you both need to focus more on spending quality time together rather than pursuing individual interests separately. Maybe you find that you're currently always in a rush without a moment to yourself. In this case, the hermit suggests that if you don't make time for yourself to rest, then your health may suffer. So take a break, even taking a few minutes every day just to clear your mind and connect with how you're feeling would benefit I like this card because it's about embracing the unknown and finding wisdom in the journey itself rather than the destination. And it asks us to take moments of introspection to trust your instincts and be patient with the unfolding of life's mysteries. And just like the hermit, use the light of the lantern to illuminate your path and take one step at a time, relying on your inner power to guide you forward. Yeah, that's lovely. Also, that to me is Odin, the All Father, 
who's walking amongst us here on earth, keeping an eye on us and checking us, uh, moving among the world of men. And the light inside the lantern is also guidance from the subconscious. The whole thing that like, even though you wander, those who wander are not always lost. So thank you for that. Before we go out, I also want to thank Saturday Morning Seance for another fantastic location report. And if you have any location report films you'd like to make that we could play here on Hocus Pocus that will feature your channel and so on, we'd be delighted to accept them and play them if they're appropriate and good for the, for the show. We do look for 14, 14 topics, though. That's what we're after. And, you know, broadly speaking, 14 topics. And uh, so thank you for that again, Saturday morning seance. Good night, Sarah. Thank you again for a very interesting and enjoyable show. And good night, everybody else. Good night. <laughs>